as I move forward in my search. Don't think for one moment that I was waking up every morning and saying, now who am I going to go and find today? No. But the world is a place, and it was a place then, particularly then, where people would grab me every now and again and try to pull me back into the dunya and just let the desires explore. You see? So come here, have this drink, have this, have that. It's great. You don't need all that rubbish. And there was a guy all this time, he'd, I'd spend some time with him at, at the weekends. You know, for eight years I was with him. And I remember one day in the weekend, and he would say to me, you know, there's something wrong with you. It really is. What's wrong with you? Why are you so concerned about things? You, you're almost mad. And he suggested that even he would get me a doctor. You see? Because I was striving against the norms in society. And that time I went through a lot. I was reading a lot and I started to drink. Because I, I just wanted to just relax and just take all the pain away of the world. And there were days then when I would look outside and see the light and then just want to turn the light off. You see? And I would look out and, and outside and just say to myself, hey, I don't need this dunya. I don't need this world, you know. There's no purpose to it, so why am I bothering? There were times when I spent days and days and days on my own, didn't talk to anyone. And there were times when I used to look out of the window in the night and just search, search for the truth in the skies. I used to look at the stars and I started reading about astronomy. I would look at the sun and the moon. I would read about these heavenly bodies. And I would say, I would say, look at the enormity of this world, this universe. The nearest star being, you know, four light years away. 186 meters per second per second, light traveling from my eye to that star. At that speed for four years before I'd even get to the nearest star. And I said, oh, I, I really was frightened. I was so petrified because I didn't know why and I was looking at these amazing things going on around me. It was one day that I decided I'm going to walk into the church across the road. I said, the church, they must have the answer in the church. I went in there and he wasn't ready to see me, but he told me, book an appointment to see me. You see? so. We booked the appointment to see the person who's going to tell you why you're here. Like a doctor is going to give you the medicine. The day after I came in his office, the first thing I noticed he was too busy to talk to me. Shuffling books around, papers around, answering the phone. He said, no, 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 what, what can I do for you? So at that point I said, look, I'm going to tell you that. And I poured my heart out to this man, a stranger. I said, look. You're a man of God. I want you to tell me who is God and why am I here? You have to tell me. He said, well, um, have you ever thought about doing a theology degree? I said, yes, I have thought about it. And I tried to go to Dublin Trinity, but I decided that all of the stuff seemed like dogmatic and it, it didn't make sense to me. It wasn't the truth. He said, oh, oh, well, um, well, I don't know then. He suddenly, he, he got dumbstruck because he didn't expect that answer. And he said, well, why don't you, you know, why didn't you just study a little bit about, you know, the world's religions and everything? And I said, well, look, I can't do that. I, I want to know, just tell me, look, just. Explain to me who is Allah, who is God, you see, and why am I here? He said, you know what, I'll be honest with you, I can't really help you. He said, see that church over there? I'm the person who opens it and closes it. I'm the person who looks after the people that come in and they leave. And that is it. That's my job. At that, 
I just realized that it doesn't matter whether you're, a ch you're in a church, it doesn't matter where you are, who you are, if Allah hasn't guided a person, it doesn't make any difference. You know, that person is not going to be help, able to help you. So imagine I've gone through Buddhism, I've gone, I also went through Hinduism, I went through socialism, I went through Christianity now, twice I'd met the Christians and I hadn't got the answers. I'd gone through, uh, you know, Tai Chi, I was doing Tai Chi and martial art, meditation, and I'd done, I'd, I'd tried veganism as well, vegetarianism and, and veganism. It didn't give me the answer. None of them gave me the answer. And at one point I got into science and I started studying silence and science and astronomy and that just confused me because what I realized is science is just about attaching labels to things which are obvious but there's no explanation and that really worried me because I realized then that this 5% they didn't have a clue in fact they were hiding the truth away from the rest of humanity because they did have the truth but they just weren't experimenting properly they weren't asking the right questions like why am I here how where am I going to go after this these are the important questions the perennial questions that every human being needs to pose to himself and to others around him. So then, Ramadan, 14, 14, 15 years ago now, in the university, I didn't know it was Ramadan. I had this girlfriend, and we won't, for obvious reasons, we won't identify the, the person. But she happened to be a Muslim. But I didn't know that at the time. I, mean, I didn't even focus on the Muslim bit because it wasn't important for anyone. Malaysian. And as it happened, one day she came to me and she said, Look, this month, this coming month, please don't come here. And I had struggled to make relations with this girl because I thought it would help me spiritually, emotionally, etc. And then she turns up and says, don't come here for the next month. So I said to her, simply, I said, either your religion doesn't make any sense. Because she told me then, of course, it was religion and it was Ramadan. Or you're not following your religion properly. She became angry. She said, don't you cuss my religion. Don't you dare do that. Became angry. So I moved off. I pulled off. And straight away the next day, I went straight to the Islamic society in the university. and said, you've got to tell me about Islam. There's this girl, and I love her. And I want to find out about it, so maybe we can patch things up. So they said to me, <laughs> I said, brother, you know, Hey, you have to leave that girl alone. The first thing is, don't, don't go with that girl. I said, well, you know, that's not really very fair because I love that girl. What's wrong with that? No, 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 because she's not supposed to do these things, you see. So they gave me some books. Started reading loads and loads of books about Islam. I'd go back to her and I'd explain to her, you know, I've read this stuff. And by the way, do you know you're not supposed to do this and this? Why didn't you tell me these things? You know, I would have respected you. I wouldn't have done those things. Oh, it's only for religious people and stuff like that to come back with the answers. So I said, well, look, at the end of the day, you know, why don't we just get married? We can sort this out, you know. At that time, I didn't, I hadn't read that, of course, I, you, you have to be a Muslim to marry a, <laughs> you know, a Muslim girl. So she put me off. And she became very angry with me because, you know, she saw that I was getting close to this thing which was going to maybe <laughs> ruin things, you know. That, of course, I, you, you have to be a Muslim to marry a, <laughs> you know, a Muslim girl. So she put me off and she became very angry with me because, you know, she saw that I was getting close to this thing which was going to maybe <laughs> ruin things, you know. So, shway by shway, little bit by bit, reading and reading and reading, I started to look at the world outside. 
with new glasses on. It's like somebody had put a pair of glasses on, suddenly I could see things in focus, you know? I could see the foreground and I could see the background. Whereas before, things were a bit cloudy and hazy. And the more I studied, I studied to fast in the month of Ramadan. I studied to fast. And sometimes I would go to the masjid, the small masala, and I would just join their prayers. I didn't even know what I was saying. I was just doing the motions. And after some time, this uh, occasion happened that I was with some people one night, and I had been continually fasting and reading and making dhikr and asking Allah for help. She was getting further and further away from me. And my objective was to get closer to her. Read the books and do the fasting. So I get closer to her. And I started to see the world as a totally different place. You wouldn't believe how someone can change overnight. Like two, two weeks, I became somebody who just didn't know anything as to somebody who really had some sort of confidence about why I was here. But it wasn't written on me yet. It wasn't part of Yusuf. It wasn't part of Tim. I was in London, and I was with these guys that I used to know back in the days. And then I had a terrible evening with them, because everything they did contradicted what I was doing for two weeks. They want to drink, they want to do all sorts. I won't even mention the things they were doing disreputable things. So I was contrad they were contradicting me, and I was contradicting them. I, for the whole night, I just kept reading the book. They were just gone, I was in a room on my own. And then I went to the bathroom, I just made wudu, I just made the ghusl, I, I didn't know what I was doing, because I didn't know ghusl really. I just read some stuff in a book. And I became totally and utterly focused on Islam has to be the right way. It was that night. In the morning I woke up early just to get away from the house because I couldn't be with those people anymore. It was like, you know, they were dirty and there were some serious problems with them and I need to get out of there. Something forced me out of the door. I walked up the road and I met this man and because he had brown skin I thought maybe, maybe he's going to know where the mosque is, you know, so a bit ignorant at that time. I didn't realize, I thought, you know, anybody can be a Muslim. He asked, he told me there's a mosque up the road. It was Balam Mosque. I went into the mosque and this guy grabbed hold of me. And he said, what's going on? Well, why are you here? I said, well, you know, there's something I have to do today. I mean, it's that, um, I didn't even know what it was called. Shahada. But I said to him, the place out there is bad and I know that there's a better way and I, I, I believe that uh, the Quran can answer my problems so uh, alhamdulillah by the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was in the month of Ramadan early in the morning I went to there in the front and took the shahada and the whole masjid loads of brothers there must have been about three four hundred people in there the whole of them each and every one of them embraced me and said salams to me and congratulations that you you found your life and the solemnitude of what I've done of what I had done was comparatively speaking was like life versus death and death versus life because if I hadn't if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hadn't guided me it would have been just like death and it's like that for 80 to 90 percent of the world's population if you think about it it's just death upon death each day you're just getting closer to your appointed period of death but you're dead in the dunya and you're going to be dead in the akhir, in the grave and you're going to be punished in the hereafter and you know any you've no idea the mercy and the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes a person come to this deen. Alhamdulillah. Before I reverted to Islam, the truth of the matter is, I did not know what contentment was. 
because contentment comes from finding yourself upon the truth. And if you're upon the truth, you will be contented. But I mean, I'm not just talking about for one day. I'm talking about no matter what happens to you, wherever you are, whomever you are with, you will have that ultimate peace and tranquility in your heart. So when I became Muslim, when I refound my beginning, my origin, the fitrah, I discovered that my depression disappeared. I discovered my reliance on alcohol at that time completely disappeared. That I didn't need anything or anyone because I'd found that ultimate truth from within and externally. And of course, I had the brotherhood. Myself and my wife, basically, we married, we arranged the marriage ourselves because when you revert to Islam, there's a lot of people who are not really practicing Islam. They're practicing what their forefathers were practicing, which is their culture. Huh? And it's not to, much to do with Islam. Because if a person, as you know, one of the conditions of sadaqa, one of the, the, can, the groups of people that it is paid to, is it's paid to the reverts. It's paid to the converts or the reverts, whichever phrase you prefer. And this is why. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in His infinite wisdom and mercy, He recognizes the need to support those people who are in the most needy categories. And the needy categories, one of them is when you come into the path of Allah, you need as much support as you can. Why? Because the shaitan is attacking you left, right, and center. Is now trying to knock you off the path. And he uses some of the Muslims, some of the non-Muslims, all of the enemies of Allah, they come and they start attacking you. He uses the family. Sometimes he even uses your own family. And the first two, three years of marriage were tough. And we tried to practice the deen. We tried to pray a little bit. My wife tried to put the hijab on a bit. And we grew organically as Muslims. Because you have to remember, of course, the Quran was revealed over 23 years. It didn't just come overnight and everybody just sat on it and just said, hey, we believe in it and we're going to do. Likewise, when people come into the deen, we all need to realize that they need supporting. They need to be goaded correctly. You need to use wisdom with them. You need to use fair preaching with them. And you need to treat them like babies. They're small babies. That's what they are. I'm actually only 15 years old, you know. The rest of my life was about struggling, just struggling and getting through and getting by. So the family, alhamdulillah, and the family affairs were very good, alhamdulillah, after a time, after two, three years. And then when kids started coming, that gave me also an added purpose, alhamdulillah. My father, I hadn't seen him for a long time. And before I reverted to Islam, I had an address in Ireland. He was Irish and uh, just Whitefields Farm in Mount Rath, that's where it was. So I hitchhiked one day to go and find him because I thought that if I found my father, it would help me to somehow know who I was and what I was doing here. So I hitchhiked all the way. I got to the place. It took me ages to find the place because it was a very <laughs> incomplete address, no postcode. And I found my uncle and my extended family there. And then, uh, you know, I stayed with them for two weeks. However, my father was living in Reading, <laughs> just around the corner from me, basically. So the whole journey, I had to come all the way back to go and find him. And eventually I found him. And unfortunately, he was an alcoholic, basically. I mean, he just lived digging the roads and building houses and then getting drunk in the night. And that was his whole life. When I embraced Islam, he just thought it was a bit of a joke. He didn't really even know what was going on. My mother, initially, as did my mother's family, they considered that it was just a passing phase. They said, well, look, we saw you as a Buddhist. We saw you talking about Christianity. We saw you talking about Tolstoy and veganism and vegetarianism. And this is just another phase. Good. It's all very healthy. We really like it. Three years after I became Muslim, I married my wife, alhamdulillah. 
they started to see this was, wasn't so much of a face. Firstly, it had lasted three years. Secondly, I was married to a woman who was Moroccan, and alhamdulillah, she, she wanted to practice the deen of Allah as well. And thirdly, I started to turn down invitations which were about alcohol and partying and dancing and stuff like that. I said, I, I don't have any interest in those things. I don't need those things. When it got to that stage, they became a little bit suspicious. Then one day, I was invited to give a lecture in Trafalgar Square. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but the BBC were there filming it all. And when I gave my talk, I just became emotional and started putting my fist in the air and saying, Allahu Akbar, and crazy stuff that you don't do really in front of the BBC. As it happened, the BBC filmed me and showed me on the, on the 6 o'clock and the 9 o'clock news. So then when I got home, I had got this mad rush of phone calls from my family saying, Tim, what's wrong? What's happened to you? So in actual fact, in actual fact, you know, they found out about my Islam via the mass media machine who made it look like I was a complete nutter. Ever since then, generally speaking, they really haven't trusted me. So there's a message here, you know, it's about, you know, you know, the media and, and, and the way we use the media. And I believe that, um, uh, that they know that it's changed my life for the best. For instance, I'm the only member of my extended family, as far as I know now, stable. I don't go around beating my kids and beating my wife or running off with other women or my wife doesn't run off with other men. And it's, it's normal and it's healthy. And they've seen it. And even my sister, we interviewed her the other day for another channel and because we were doing the same sort of thing. We found that, um, you know, she was saying, it's brilliant. What's happened to him is absolutely brilliant. And after the interview, she even said to me, you know, you know uh, she said to one of the researchers, you know, I really love my brother. And I, I think, but I'm worried about what he's upon. You know, he's upon the, uh, this, this terrorism thing. So this just tells you what the media system uh, does in way of brainwashing the people against the haq, the haq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.